Ready? All right. Well, welcome back after the break. Um, so we talked about some basic stuff that I think actually is really valuable because without knowing that, um, a lot of the stuff here will seem uh, maybe perhaps even out of place. But we're going to take it a step further and talk about proper inheritance. And for inheritance to be proper, it really is all about how you set it up. And contracts will play a big role in that. So here we go, proper inheritance. So I assert that there are three kinds of inheritance. And I assert that because there are three kinds of member functions. So for fun, would somebody like to tell me what the three kinds of member functions are? Public, private, protected. Okay, public, protected, and what? Private. Okay, and you? Uh, virtual, abstract, and uh, uh, concrete. Virtual, abstract, and concrete. So this was the first suggestion. Okay, so it's not that. <laughs> now, I want to understand yours better. Virtual, What's the difference between virtual, abstract, and concrete? I think uh, you may be onto it. Virtual function with no definition. Uh, uh, virtual function with definition. And uh, a regular number. I, I think he's actually said it. I think he's actually got it. Interface inheritance, pure virtual functions. Structural inheritance, non-virtual functions. Implementation inheritance, non-pure virtual functions. That's what you said, right? Nice. That's a trick question. You got it. I, by the way, it's, it's obvious I had to do it. What can I say? All right, so let's take a look at what we mean by interface inheritance, right? We have a class channel, let's say, and it's got an abstract interface. You know, we have a destructor, and then we have a, a, some, some pure virtual functions. And then derived from it, we have this TCP channel, which is a public channel, and it implements the functionality in the abstract base class. So that's interface inheritance. Here's structural inheritance. By the way, I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. I'm just saying what it is. Here we have a pixel. Here we have a point. The point has some operations, and the pixel adds some operations. In particular, it adds the notion of color. OK? Now, you see a very strong difference between these two kinds of inheritance. OK. The third one is implementation inheritance. And here you have something that does a lot of stuff. And then, and, it, and you can instantiate it, it's all good. And then you have something derived from it that changes what it does. So that's implementation here. You're inheriting the implementation into the higher level class. OK. All very different. So what is proper inheritance? Um, it means a lot of things. There's some things that are common to all inheritance, and there's some things that are different. You know, it implements, it extends, is substitutable for, we call that ISA. We use ISA for all of that, but, hmm. So, so you might think, is a relationship, what does it mean? What does the is a relationship mean? It, it, it should have some semantics, right? Weaker preconditions, stronger postconditions, same invariance. What does this, by the way, what does it mean for something to have a weaker precondition? What does weaker mean? Uh, can, uh, any, precondition, any preconditions that it meets would meet the preconditions of what it, what it inherits from, but... Any preconditions it meets would meet the con preconditions that it inherits from. So I want to try to get the direction right. Like it might be, might be a, I, I'm, I'm, in my head, I'm thinking of it as a stronger precondition, like more strict. But okay, so which, is, is it that the base class or the derived class has the stronger precondition? The, the, I would see the derived class as being more strict about the preconditions so that that... Well, let's think about what we just said. You call something from the base class, let's say. You call, you call a, a, a function on the base class. We're going to talk about this in really gory detail. And uh, unfortunately, what you passed into the base class doesn't work for the derived class. That is a fat interface. But what you pass into the if you pass something into a base class and the derived class can't handle it, yeah. Yeah. then that's a fat interface. Yeah, and, and I guess, yeah, I must. It's the other way around. Yeah. Well, anyway, but this is something that, that's been talked about. When we say weaker, it's not, it's not a, a, it has to be a, a proper a, 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 a set of a containment. So the, the weaker precondition contains 
the stronger precondition, right? The weaker, the weaker precondition means I accept more. Stronger preconditions, I accept less. But there's no Venn diagram here, right? Okay. And same invariance, right? That's, that's, this is something that's, that was proposed as a way of thinking about inheritance. Another one is providing a proper superset of behavior, right? Another one is substitutability of what? What criteria do we use? This is, this is an interesting, interesting thing to think about. So we have this over here, and I'm going to throw this out. The is a relation, and by the way, uh, even this is not the final word on the subject. The, the implementation of a derived class must satisfy simultaneously its own contract as well as that of each base class. If this isn't true, something, something is, is, is off. Let's just say that. That doesn't mean it can never happen. And we can talk about special cases where uh, you have something, and in fact, I'll just bring it up. Imagine you have an allocator. But this is the last time we're going to talk about this. Is, this is one of those things, the exception to the rule. I have an allocator, and, uh, and, and I, want to, uh, uh, I want to pass it in to some sort of object because it needs an allocator. And the, the abstract class, it's just an abstract class. It says the memory you get from calling allocate on this allocator will be naturally aligned. But it's just English. Now the object, the closest thing it has to what it wants is this allocator interface. But it doesn't need natural alignment. It'll take byte alignment, which is, which is a weaker precondition than, than natural alignment. But this thing says it's going to be naturally aligned. If it's naturally aligned, it's byte aligned. That's fine. So that's no problem there. But then somebody wants to pass in a byte aligned allocator to this, this, this object, and all they have is this, this abstract interface that has all the right functions, but the wrong comment. So what they need to do, both of them, they need to say in their contract, they need to say, I take an allocator, but I don't care as long as it's byte aligned. It doesn't have to be naturally aligned. So the big green letters there. And then the person who derives from the allocator and says, I'm a byte aligned allocator in big red letters. Say, I violate the contract. Then you get somebody who can read, like a judge, and you see that there's two consenting adults that want to do something that's out of contract. And the judge says, yeah, I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you in there and I know I've read all the stuff and it's all good. That can happen. Now that I've said that, we won't talk about that anymore. All right. So what about the following general property? This is going to require, again, this, this is the second session, so this hurts your head more than the first session. Must. For inheritance to be proper, any operation that can be invoked on a derived class object via a base class pointer or reference must behave identically if we replace that base class pointer or reference with a corresponding derived class one. Now, when you first read this, if you're not really careful, you might say, no, 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 that, that doesn't sound right. Does anybody feel like, doesn't sound right? Not, I'm not convinced. Is anybody not convinced? Oh, you guys, come on. All right, so the key thing is that this is an object. This is one object. And there are two interfaces. There's the one from the base class and the one from the drive class. And it shouldn't matter whether you're calling the function from a base class interface or a drive class interface if it's valid to call it from the base class. This is a substitutability property. Now, let's take a look at what we mean. We have a base class, we have a derived class, we have a function that takes an int, a double, and a char star. Okay? We have a derived class, also has a function that takes an int, a double, and a const char star. Put that down there. Now, suppose I have the derived class and I say uh, new derived. Right? So I have a pointer to that. And here's some memory. And now, at this address, uh, 2140, I'm going to allocate some memory. And here I am. Object of type derived. This is what you think about whenever you're programming object-oriented programming. Right? It, it, this comes up in, right in your mind. Then, there's the address. And unless we're talking about multiple inheritance, it's going to be the same address for the base class and the derived class. Right? So there you go. So far, so good? OK. Now I create a base class, and I assign it the derived class pointer. 
derived class address. So base class pointer, derived class address, they're the same. And I get this. Now, I have, I call this 1, 2.0, and 3. And I call this 1, 2.0, and 3. So the base and derived. What must be true? They have identical behavior. Not similar behavior, identical behavior, right? <laughs> Nothing short of identical. The same observable behavior. Okay. So this is a claim. I'm claiming the proper inheritance. For it to be proper, this has to be true. And this is how virtual functions work. There's no choice. There's only one, for a given object, there's only one virtual function in place, right? Doesn't matter where you call it. You know, there's going to be one place. Okay. So let's take a look at what this means. So let's look at the function f. In the base class, it's defined for all f. So it must be defined for all f in the derived class, right? If it's not, it's a fat interface. If, if f is defined for all x in the base class and for only non-negative integers in the derived class, this is not proper, right? For, all, for each x, it does the same thing, base and derive. Does anybody feel like they're getting cheated here? They wanted to do something different. I just, I don't know if this is so obvious or not. Let's look at the next one. I have G. G is defined in the base class for all non-negative integers. It's defined in the derived class for all integers. Okay? For the non-negative integers that are valid in the base class, it must do the same thing for each respective integer in the derived class. It can do anything it wants for negative integers. Right? In that sense, the derived class is substitutable for the base class. For all programs written in terms of the base class. Okay. H doesn't exist in the base class. H exists in the derived class. H can do whatever it wants. No problem because nothing written in terms of the base class can access H. So far so good? I want to make sure that we're on the same, this is, this is the meat right here, so we have to make sure we're good. For each, this is, this is what was suggested. Uh, for each function uh, D colon colon F in the derived class, overriding a virtual one B colon colon F in the base class, the documented preconditions of D colon colon F must be no stronger than those of B colon colon F and the post conditions no weaker. And by that we mean if they are, it's a fat interface and the other one, it's lying. It's not satisfying the post condition that it promised to do. It's not adhering to the base class contract. All right. Now, typically when we write an abstract interface and then we implement it, most of the time what we're doing is we have the same set of virtual functions and we're just implementing it the way we want to. And perhaps there are some non-virtual functions in the derived class that help us set, configure the state, uh, and that's fine. But basically the sweet spot is you've got some functions in the, in the base class and you have the same set of functions in the derived class that, that, that implement the base class. So we just take this, are typically the same. The post conditions are different sometimes, right? We have different derived classes, they do different things. Okay. So here I have a channel. And uh, this channel says, write the specified number of bytes from the specified buffer. Return zero on success and a non-zero value otherwise. The behavior is undefined unless zero less than or equal to num bytes less than or equal to 32767. Now, we may not like what this says. We may think this is a horrible way to write software. But this is what it says. We can certainly do this, right? We can, there you go. Whoop, <laughs> I think I almost took his head off. All right, now, Suppose we derive a TCP channel, and this TCP channel says return zero on success and a non-zero value, otherwise the behavior is undefined unless zero equals numbytes mod four. Can we do this? Now, what's wrong? What exactly is wrong? The conditions are stronger. The preconditions are stronger. Is that what you're saying? Yes, the preconditions are stronger in the sense that this would accept one and this one won't. 
even though that will accept any integer as long as it's mod 4 that doesn't matter because the base class gets the first thing we can't we don't want to have a, uh, a, a, a fat interface so we don't want to do that all right let's make it a little bit more challenging now it says return 0 on success 1 if 0 not equal to num bytes mod 4 and a negative value otherwise is this okay Yes, sir. Um, I would say that it's not okay because the base class is saying if it was successful, we return zero. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the the derived class, I mean, it, it unless if num bytes mod four does not equal zero, then it's not successful. Then I guess it would be. Well, the bottom one says it returns zero on success and a non-zero value otherwise, and the top one says it returns zero on success. 1 if 0 is not equal to num 4. So in other words, it's not successful because for I mean, that reason. Question of like which or, like is it anything yeah. that's successful returns 0? It says it, if I actually wrote the bytes, it returns 0. Okay. If I didn't write the bytes because it wasn't mod 4, then I return 1. And if it, it, I didn't write the bytes for some other reason, then I return a negative value. That's what that says. The question, you said, you don't think it's good, but I don't understand the reason. Do you have an idea? Yeah. You think it's good? Yeah, because it's like um, if people are using channel and are checking, okay, it's an error, it's non zero, the code still works. People are like, especially working with TCP channel, get like more information due to this error code. Well, they get more information, but, but here's, a, here's a problem. I, I don't know how you'd feel. You, you've written something, this is the base class. You don't see this because it's not visible to you, right? You, somebody is passing this in at a higher level. And you're operating off the base class. And so you're expecting, right? You're, you're, you're expecting that, that th when you call this function, that if, if I give it a number between 0 and 32767, it'll make a good faith effort to do the operation. But it doesn't. It doesn't try at all to do the operation if you don't give it something mod 4. Oh. So I'm telling you that no matter how you try to reason about it legally, go ahead. Um. So I, I think that the fact that you have this return code says that there are reasons that it can fail, that, and you haven't specified what those reasons are, so those can vary based on the implementation. channel implementation specifically happens to require this. I, I to have a return code saying success or fail. Because it, doesn't, because it doesn't tell me anything else that I need to do from the parameter list. Now, the thing might fail because, because there's something wrong with the operating system where there might be, you know, the, the lines down or whatever. But that's not in my control. This is in my control and I have no clue that it's my fault that this isn't going through. Don't worry, I'll make it even more obvious. So, uh, this is absolutely not okay. This, if somebody were to write this code, pretty soon somebody would come to them and smack them. <laughs> How about this one? This actually happened to me. So, uh, you know, it's all working and then you port it to Windows because it's a portable library. Oh, but oh, wait. But it didn't violate the contract letter of the law, but there's something about common law where it's not going to fly. And there are many examples of this. And, and one of my favorites is, suppose you want your house painted. I'll pick on you. You want your house painted. So you go to the, 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 the fellow that does the house painting, and you make a deal with him, uh, you, a contract. Uh, you're willing to pay him $5,000, and he's going to paint your whole house, or say he didn't. Is that OK? <laughs> Small claims court time. <laughs> right? I'll paint your, I'll, I'll, you give me $5,000, I'll either paint your house or, or tell you I didn't do it. You still lose the five thousand dollars, but okay. So that's my point. The point is, there is something more than the letter of the law. There is an expectation of a good faith effort to do something that is outside of my control. It's they're going to do the best they can. If they can't, it's perfectly fine to return a bad status, but don't ever let me find out that you had a contract with the minus one or the mod four because I will come. Yes. Um, so what if um, instead uh, it was that? The base class channel says what it says, mm -hmm. and then the derived class says buffer must be aligned by 
you know, some multiple of 32. Yes. So, so, so what was said is you're making a good faith effort, but your implementation is just requiring this alignment. So, so what was said is, what if there's some sort of extra requirement for this to work ever? Mm -hmm. It's a fat interface. It's a fat interface because it doesn't do the good faith effort that this claims to do. It does another good faith effort that's different. Um, I would tell you that any time, any time you put more restrictions on how this thing is going to be able to work at all, it's it's in effect. It's in effect making it a fat interface, and it's it's very deceptive and it's it's very infuriating. So I'm going to say let's not let's not try to do the letter of the law. It's not going to work out well for you. You know what I'm saying? We have to think about our clients. We have to say, are they going to be okay? And I, no, nah, they're not going to be okay. <clears throat> so what is a proper subtype or subclass? So. Uh, Barbara Liskov said this in one of her extremely famous papers, perhaps the most, one of two papers that I've read in my life that's been a profound effect on me. Um, the other one was by Dijkstra, uh, and it was on, on, on something that really had to do with physical design, and it was in 1968. Um, but uh, but that, was, that was one. This is another. This has so much good stuff in it. And one of the things she said, uh, a type hierarchy is composed of subtypes and supertypes. The intuitive idea of a subtype is one whose object provides all the behavior of object of another type, the supertype, plus something extra. That's a really good way to think about the substitutability property that we'll get to shortly. Um, but, but that's good intuition. So let's, let's go with that. So here we have a channel. We can create a channel. A, a TCP channel, we, the channel interface, we can't create it. So a channel uh, and then a TCP channel, a, a TCP channel is a channel that we can create. Okay? A pixel is a point that we can set the color to. We can get and set the color. Something more. Now, what we have to be careful about is as soon as we get to the point where it can do some things better but not other things better, it does them worse, we no longer have the substitutability property. We have that fat interface thing going on again. Uh, or something similar to it. The third one, implementation inheritance. Uh, uh, we can create something else with it. Now, if you look at these, notice blue. I happen to like blue. I'm not as fond of green. And I don't like red. Okay, so that's why I chose these colors. And, and I want you to get the idea that the one on the left is good, the one in the middle is sometimes very rarely, but sometimes good. The one on the end is a very special case that unless you're doing frameworks uh, of a very special type, and we'll talk more about them, not so good. This one is, is, is misused tremendously. Okay? All right. What do you mean by create something? Okay, so the idea is uh, the, the composite widget, widget is taking functionality. The question was, what do you mean by, by, by creating something else with it? The widget is something. I created a widget. Now, I have this other thing that derives from it. So what can I do with the other thing that derives from it? Well, it's a composite widget, and it's overridden many of the methods. So the thing that I'm doing on top is a different thing. It's a composite widget, not a widget. It's a composite widget. It does other things. The, the implementation inheritance uh, uh, conflates two things that you're trying to do. And again, we'll talk more about that, but it, 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 it couples uh, uh, dealing with the, 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 uh, the client of the base class and dealing with the derived class author. And so, as I said, what's happening here is not a pure, it's not, but there, there's, a, there's a pure extension, there's a, a kind of funny thing going on in the green, and then there's something that's really kind of ugly going on in the red. And I'm saying this is a sequence that goes from good to not so good. And we want to look at how it's not so good. Okay, so what is Liskov substitution? I, I have to have this slide. I'm addicted to this. I think it's just the greatest thing because everybody seems to think they know, or many people do, think to know what Liskov substitution is. And uh, what motivated it? Um, how does it relate to inheritance in C++? Now, when I was reading her paper, um, she, wasn't, uh, she was talking about if I hope I recall this correctly, I want to make sure it's, it's correct. The way you build up a program, you start with something structural, and you say, I need, let's say I, I needed a point, and then I have something that operates on the point, this is my function, and then I realize I'm going, I'm building the program, and building it, and I say, oh, I need something else. So you derive from the point, and then at that point, at that, at that time, 
You say, all right, well, now I'm going to, the functionality here is going to take a pixel, but when it gets down to the subroutines, it'll just take a point. And you just build this whole thing up. And now, if you want to take something out, well, it's very clear because this type does with this function, so you can just remove it, and the type system sort of keeps you honest. And then at the end of the whole thing, when you're all done and it's all happy, you just turn it into a, a single struct and get rid of all of the, 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 the complexity. And you know, this is a way to do programs. This was a suggestion, and hence the name structural inheritance that I use. Um, how does it relate to inheritance in C++? This is going to be an interesting question. Um, after Liskov substitution is, apl uh, is applied, can observable behavior be subtly different? Now, this is something that I find fascinating because people have very strong opinions of this, this third one. What do you think? After this is applied, can the behavior be different? I'm deliberately saying this in vague ways because you'll see why. But, but can it be different or not? No, no one wants to... You can't violate the contract. <laughs> you can't violate the contract, but that's not what I said. Right. So can I, it, what, what, we don't even know what Liskov substitution is, but let's say we did it, whatever it is. <laughs> Could the behavior be different somehow, even if a little bit? No. You say no. I'll oh, see now that, and? Yeah, I'd say no. But well. you're going to say, yeah, I'd say no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> would you also say no? I, I would say yes. But yes, okay. If you okay. had something that ran faster, that's observable behavior could run faster, but that it didn't do the exact same thing. It just did it in a completely different way that didn't. I totally agree with the sentiment. It was said, what if it does the same, that the same post conditions, but it ran more quickly? Absolutely. Uh, the speed is not part of the substitutability criteria unless it's some order of magnitude slower, in which case then it's not. But if it runs faster, pretty much you're good. But we still, I don't know if everybody agrees on what Liskov substitution is, so we have to get there. Okay. Does it apply to all three kinds of inheritance? This is all just baiting you. It's not, you know, okay. Does it have any other practical applications? All right. The, the key point here is we have to know what Liskov substitution is. Does anybody feel like giving it a shot? You're going to do it? Okay. Uh, if it looks like a duck, it should act like a duck. Okay, it was said, if it looks like a duck, it should act like a duck. That sounds like as good a definition as I've heard, although I don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have a look. So, this should be very familiar. This is the original phraseology, and I, I put some types in just for, uh, just for fun. Uh, wish th is there any way to make that go away, that thing on the bottom? On the slide. You think? Am I going to be sorry that I did that? <laughs> Click on the slide. Urgh. No, that, that, just, that just advanced it. All right, well, I apologize. We're going to have this thing here. So if you look at this, for each object 01 of type S, there is an object 02 of type T such that for all programs P uh, defined, here we go, uh, <coughs> P defined in terms of T, the behavior of P is unchanged when O1 is substituted for O2, then S is a subtype of T. And the P part here, I, I didn't read it so beautifully in lockstep with the, with the colors. This is the thing. If you're writing a function in terms of the base class, or in terms, I shouldn't say base class. If you're writing a function in terms of the uh, super subtype, thank you, I'll get it right. If you're writing a function in terms of the subtype, uh, then there should be, uh, uh, and, and there exists object in, in the super type uh, that can be substituted for objects in the, in the subtype, never mind constructively, just do they exist? Uh, without any change in observable behavior, well then, the, the, the uh, super type is substitutable for the subtype. Now, the, the, the crazy thing here is we have bool and fool. There's no inheritance going on here at all. None. Zero. Zip nada. But we created a bool false and a bool true. And over here we created a fool false and a, and a, and a fool true. And now you notice the order is just reversed. So we have this mapping. There, exi there does exist a derived object for each base object for every program that uses the base object. So it's good. So the answer is yes, fool is a subtype of bool. But then bool is a subtype of fool, fool is a subtype of bool. It's the same thing. But that's not C++ inheritance. 
So when people tell you all well, Liskov substitution, it's all good. Huh? Okay. So that's disturbing. Right? Now, if you don't understand this on first blush, it's okay because it's taken me a very long time to understand it. And so I, uh, I tried to rewrite it in slightly better terms that would make it seem like it's more appropriate to C++. So I'll try reading it again. If for each derived class object, and I just say this to try to orient you, O1 of type S, there exists a base class object O2 of type T, such that for all programs P defined in terms of type T, the behavior P is unchanged when the derived class object O1 is substituted for the base class object O2, then S is a subtype of T. Try again. For each derived class object D of type D, there exists a base class object B of type B, such that for all programs P defined in terms of type B, the behavior of P is unchanged when the derived class object D is substituted for the base class object B, then D is a subtype of B. Notice we're trying to just edge it in, just kind of try to just change the names and make it apply to C++. Then, I just changed it back to the original thing with no extra words. So now this is just a change of variables. There is nothing different between the top and the bottom. But it sounds good, right? If for each object D of type D, there exists an object B of type B such that for all programs P defined in terms of B, the behavior of P is unchanged when D is substituted for B, then D is a subtype of B. How does that help us? Seriously. So come back and look at this. Necessary but not sufficient for inheritance, and by this definition, every empty type is a subtype of all types. And you know, it doesn't quite get done what we need it to do. But this does. This is important. So we're going to put Liskov substitution on hold since it doesn't apply to C inheritance, and talk about something that does. So we went one extreme, we went like math, and that didn't work out for us so well. So we're going to do the other extreme and go macros. Macros are good, trust me. We all understand them, they're our friends. So notice this macro up here. It says use derived class interface. If that is set, you say, you know, dash D on the command line, we know that that code's gonna execute. Notice there's an else. So it's otherwise the other thing's gonna execute. Notice the only difference is we have a derived and we have a base pointer invoking the interface. So we have a derived interface and a base interface. And notice, they should be the same for all programs written in terms of the base interface. Notice it's just so close to Liskov substitution, and yet it's so far. Oh, well. Still a very important concept. Not joking about that. So let's say we have this program that we're trying to write, and um, we want to call any program. And we're going to call it on... We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna create any program, right? We're gonna pass in a pixel. But depending on whether we've set the program up to, to access the information via uh, the base class interface or the derived class interface, we'll be calling it from, from, the, uh, from the pixel pointer or the point pointer. Do you get the idea? We're just, that's all, that's the only difference. So here we have any program, and it says C out, P points to X, Open, close, end L. Good old basic C++. And I have a point X down here. It's even made it const and all. So that's, that's what point does. So far, so good. Now, I have a set. Is that OK? Are these OK? This is all good. Because any program that I write, um, it doesn't matter whether I call it from the base or derived class. I'm going to get the same thing so far, right? Now, suppose I have a color up here. Now, it turns out that there is, no, there is no way to call the point class from this, so it doesn't count. It's, it's, it doesn't matter. This, this, this doesn't hurt anything. There's no way to have a difference between the two. Right? So if I wrote a program in terms of the base class, I couldn't use that. So I'm safe. Okay. Now, here we get a little interesting. Suppose the derived class overrides the base class. Shouldn't say that. Hides the base class. My bad. Hides the base class with um, a print statement built in. Now, 
This is something that has been suggested for type checking, for parameter checking, ah, precondition checking in something like an array. You can imagine a checked array is an array that does the checking. And it's, it's, there's no virtual function. The checked array simply does this kind of thing. It just puts in a check. And if, and if, and if you're out of your, the, the, the index operator is out of bounds or whatever it is, it does something. That's been proposed. But it does violate something, right? Because depending on whether I call it from the base class or the derived class pointer, it does something different. And that is, in fact, the problem. The checked array is not substitutable for the array because it'll get sliced when it goes through an interface, right? So this is not OK. And it translates to a lot of things that are not OK. So don't do this. How about this? I have a, a static num set. And quietly in the, in the pixel, I'm going to save the information. You know, I, I, I call this function again. Is this OK as of right now? Well, it depends on whether there's a way to get that from the base class uh, interface. But there isn't. It's in the derived class. So that's OK. And if I want to add even something that, uh, that returns this thing in pixel, that's fine too. Because I couldn't have used any of that for a program written in terms of the base class. So it's OK. All right. Now, how about this one? This says, if I set, set it from the base class, I'm, I'm going to set it to whatever value came in. But there's a precondition that said I'm not allowed to pass in a negative value. And in the, in the, the, the derived class, that precondition is reduced to anything but min, int min, and it'll put in the absolute value. Is this OK? Yes. I heard that yes very quickly, loud and clear. Do we all agree that this is OK? Because it's substitutable. At least it appears to be. So that's not a problem. Now there's a bit of a problem. If I, try, if I look at the type that's returned, I can do this, right? Because const point ampersand, this is the, the, the return types are, 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 what's the word for it? I forgot. Covariant. covariant. So we have covariant return types, but they're not fun. Because now I can ask the object based on its derived class or base class, what's your size? And it'll return a different value. That's unfortunate. So this, by the way, when this says size of point, for all of you that think what I meant was that, that I just replay point with pixel, no, I didn't mean that. But to make it clear, I'm going to do this, just to remove any doubt. It's 8. And by the way, that's the size of point. OK? That's just, just, just for those who argued with me last time. Uh, this is just a comment. I'm not going to replace point with, oh, yes, I will. Now it's no longer, OK? Just want you to understand, it's not a textual replacement. All right, good. Um, so this is no good, but it's worse. Look at this. All I have to do is say size of star p, and it's no good. So actually, the whole thing is no good, because there are situations where you can use point where you can't use pixel. And that means that it's not, a pixel is not substitutable for a point in all cases written in terms of the point. And can you think of um, a reason why that might be true? This might give you a hint. If I have a buffer and I've got a bunch of points and then I try to put in a pixel, that would also be a problem. OK. So just to give you a thought, it turns out that when you increase the size of something during structural inheritance, you are doing something deliberately that is not substitutable. OK. Now you can still do it, but just know you know, you're, you're bringing it on yourself. The same OK uh, to arrays of objects. All right, so I put this one up because I was going to go off and explain this some more. And then I said, I don't want to waste the time explaining this some more. So I'm putting up a nice slide. Get a glass of water. You can read it. And we will come back to it one more time before the end of the talk. Mm. Mm. All right. So it was said that syntactic expedient is a term that was liked by at least one person. Uh, okay. Are we good to go? Any questions? 
Okay, jumping back to fun things. So, I don't know if you've ever been on an interview, but this is a question that, uh, that I asked my, my uh, TL at uh, Bloomberg, who works for me, uh, extremely, extremely uh, competent guy. And I remember asking him this question, and uh, we, we argue about it. He says he doesn't remember it any, anything like the way I say it, so uh, I, I'm not gonna like, put my opinion on it. I, I don't think he got it right, but that's, you know, that's ancient history. Really, really good guy. Uh, so we have this uh, set of things, and uh, in fact, we're going to add a little bit of uh, functionality to them. The shape is an abstract interface that provides an origin, and the, uh, the polygon and the square and the rectangle all have little different things like origin and width, origin, width, and length. Polygon has the number of vertices and a bracket operator to get the ith vertex. Um, what kind of inheritance relationships, if any, do you think are proper here? Honestly, I would say it would depend a whole lot on what your plans are for using these objects. Not get fired? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> The question, it depends on what, what your plans are. And, and really, uh, th there's a lot to designing a polygon. There really is. And in fact, uh, you could write a, a section in a book on it, and I have. Uh, but that's not the, the point here. And excuse the pun. Um, I'm trying, I'm, this is more of, a, of an academic exercise because we want to learn what would be reasonable to do here. So what's the possibility? Is a rectangle a square? I, I put this one here because uh, uh, when I was first learning Java, briefly, I was looking at the Java book, and they said an ellipse was a circle with an extra focus. And I, that, that's, well, anyway. So what do you think of this? Is a rectangle a square? No. No. Okay, well, the rectangle does not respect the square's uh, um, invariance. So the square invariant. So that's not so good. Well, if that's the case, what if we go the other way? What if we say polygon is a shape? Is polygon a shape? OK. Well, by the same token, is rectangle a polygon? I see people that are begrudgingly willing to maybe entertain that as a possibility, but only temporarily. Because if this is true, then certainly this is true. Square is a rectangle, rectangle is a polygon. There's more things that are polygons than a rectangle. Okay. I think it kind of depends on what operations. Oh, it absolutely does. It suggests that the, the operations matter. Very much so. So let's take a look at a square as a rectangle, and I'm going to write a function. Nothing up my sleeve. Stretch by one. It takes a rectangle. Okay? But I'm going to pass in a square. Because I can do that, right? A square is a rectangle, so I can certainly pass in a square. And now I have r, which I think is a rectangle. And now I'm going to get its width. And then I'm going to get its length. And then I'm going to set its length to be one more than it was. And I'm going to check to make sure the width didn't change. And I'm going to make sure that the length did change. And this is kind of like a test, just to make sure that it's a rectangle. Now, what do you think happens? Not going to work very well. Not very well. <laughs> so, so what could happen? What could happen, maybe, is that we violate the invariance of the square, or we get an assert. Either way, it's not good. So this is not good. That's unfortunate. But if that's not good by the same argument, suppose somebody passes in a rectangle and I try to add a vertex to it. That would be a problem for a polygon. Takes a polygon, pass in a rectangle, bzz. So that's not good. That's not good. So now what are we going to do? Well, it turns out we can do this. But even that's not good because it doesn't, it's not very satisfying. I, you know, I don't feel like I got all the nutrition I wanted out of, of, of substitutability. So what do you do when you have two coarse uh, diagram? You make it a little bit less coarse, you know, a little finer grain. And in this case, we're going to start with a const shape and a modifiable shape. And a modifiable shape, believe it or not, is a const shape that's modifiable. Okay? So, what's the first thing we're going to do? 
we're going to say that. A, a modifiable shape is a shape that is not modifiable that is. Modifiable that is. So it, I know it sounds strange, but it's true because if you have a modifiable shape, you can do anything with it that you could do with a const shape and modify it. So by that, why not? Why not that? Why not have a, a modifiable square is a const square that's modifiable. And if you think about what you would do with a class, you would simply take all of the const methods out of the class and put them in a lower level class called const, const square, for example, and then derive the modifiable square, which has all the modifiable methods in it, and life is good. Now, if you notice, there's, there's more stuff up there, the concrete ones, because this is implicitly abstract. And, and we'll see that they can do even more with those concrete ones. But now we have to keep going with this, uh, this diagram. What do you think a const polygon is in terms of a const shape? Is a const polygon a const shape? OK. So here's an interesting one. Is a const rectangle a const polygon? Why, why yes or why no? provides all the functionality plus something extra. Okay, so a, a rectangle provides all the functionality of const polygon plus width and length. Right? Right? So it, so good. So if you have a if you have a const rectangle, you can you can do you can do anything. You can get the vertices, you can you can find out how many there are, you can get the width, you can get the length. It's all good. Right? If you have only a const polygon, you can't get the width and the length, but you can still get the vertices and the number of them. So think about it, right? Here all I can do is maybe get the origin. But here I can get the origin, the number of vertices. Here I can get the, the width and the length of the rectangle. And here I can get the side of the square. Now, can I get its width and length? Yes. And can I get all these other good things? Yes. So it's substitutable in the sense that it does everything the other ones do, and then something. And there's no size issue. Right? Life's glorious. The other side, a modifiable polygon. Is a modifiable polygon a modifiable shape? No. Why not? Well, I can set the origin. I can set the origin here, and I can set the vertices of the polygon. Right? So setting the origin is just a, another way of saying, maybe, I'm going to set the center of the shape to something. And all of these vertices are, are, are uh, relative to the center or some such thing. Yes? I think, okay, what was said is they're the same as on the previous slide. Uh, to some extent, I agree with you. I, they're not quite the same because they're oriented differently. But yes, what, what we're going to say is const rectangle is a const polygon. Const square is a const rectangle. Modifiable polygon is a modifiable shape, but a modifiable rectangle is not a modifiable polygon. Because there are, we saw, there are cases where it, it, they're not substitutable. And the same for this. So now that we're here, we use the same intuition and we say a concrete something, like a concrete square, your square, is a square that can be instantiated. It's, 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 it's real, right? It's concrete. So we have that and then the other two. And now this is the full picture of what proper inheritance could be with the definition of substitutability that we want. You buy it? Okay. It's kind of cool. There's another diagram you want to keep up if you're going to write inheriting things. So the principal clients of interface inheritance are both the public client and the derived class author. You think about, like we talked about with the allocator, the allocator gets passed into a client. Client uses the allocator protocol. I call an abstract interface a protocol. Uses the abstract, uh, uh, the, uh, uses the allocator protocol in its interface. And then the derived class author also has to read the same contract that's provided in the abstract interface and implement it. So it's a bilateral contract, right? They're both clients in some sense. All right, so here I have a channel. 
and here I have my channel. So I have read what a channel does and I'm implementing the channel. Now there's a client that wants to consume the channel. No problem. The channel is a contract. It's a bilateral contract and interface. Now I have a time channel. A time channel does everything a channel does and provides some additional methods. Another definition of widening the contract, right, besides the one where you have a wide contract is you say I can do more. You never can do less and you never can do different, but you can do more. Now I implement my, uh, your time channel. We, you implement your time channel. And uh, another client needs a time channel. A channel will not work. This is all enforced by the type system. Now, I get a third party product. And I use the adapter pattern to implement the channel using the third party product. And now, client one can use either one of those two. Whoever, whatever you pass in, I you the one. Client three can use either one. Now I have another th third party product B. This one's powerful enough to implement the time channel. And now client four can use that one along with client two, but, but clients four and two cannot use product A because it's not able, it, doesn't, it hasn't implemented that protocol. This is called a protocol hierarchy. Throw in one more for good measure. This is all set at compile time. You can't get it wrong unless you do that funny stuff where you derive from channel and you don't provide something the channel needs. Then you're back to the, the, the fat interface kind of thing. But so be it. I said I wasn't going to mention that. Oh well, I mentioned it. I won't mention it again. Ah, all right, structural inheritance. Now for some more of that crazy stuff. So we have a const lm ref, which is a reference to an element where you can't modify the element. And then we have a modifiable lm ref which is a const lm ref where you can't modify the element except you can. I know. <laughs> so, this is what we got. Start off with, we have a pointer to this element. This is what, this is our payload. This is what we're, we're referring to. And you'll note that uh, uh, we've declared the derived class to be a friend. Now, if you were in the first talk, you know that has an implication. What's the implication? Can't be long distance, so where is the derived class? In the, same. In the same component, good. All right, so it's a friend because we're gonna, we're gonna play some games with this. We're gonna, we're gonna get inside the mind of the compiler a little bit. Um, we're not gonna implement copy assignment on the const object. We, we've, we've decided not to, and we're gonna defer y until a bit later. Okay, now, uh, we have read-only access to the element. So if I call this method, I'm going to get back a const, whatever the type is, element back. Okay? Now, we're going to look at the lmref. An lmref is a const lmref type. Notice that it's public structural inheritance. Notice that there's no additional data. That's good. No additional data. Notice that we are going to implement the assignment here, and we'll explain why it's okay in this class, but not the base class. That's an additional thing you can do here, right? Everything you could do in the other one plus something. And then the last one is, we're going to take away the const and, and say you can actually write to this. Now, people notice I took away this const. I didn't take away that const. Because I'm not, that's not the point. The point is I'm giving you writable access to whatever this points to. Okay? All right. This, an element ref is a const element ref with write access. You could use a modifiable element ref in, this, in any situation, any situation at all, where you can use a const element ref. Therefore, this is proper. It's not improper, right? Like my daughter says sometimes, well, you're not wrong. At least here we're not wrong. All right. Now, here's an important point. This is really subtle. You can use user conversion, user type conversion, to implement an iterator and a const iterator, or you can use uh, structural inheritance. If you use the user type conversion, 
you're actually violating proper inheritance because if you're using the, the um, iterator in a const iterator context, it has to use up its user-defined conversion, which means it doesn't behave the same way as the const one does. Whereas here, there's no difference. You can have any number of, sta uh, of um, uh, what's the, what standard conversions. So there's, no, there's nothing used up. So this is the better implementation. And those two examples that I just gave you are about the only two I know of. So structural inheritance is not something you go do all the time. But if it satisfies these properties, then it's at least arguably proper. <sighs> I'm putting the, the implementation here. Now notice I've done a cast. Uh, this is where we're using the friendship. It is true that we could implement this without the friendship. As long as we know the implementation and it's the same component, we could go grab the thing that comes out, take its address, and do some funny things. It doesn't matter. The idea here is we are doing the long distance friendship, so we're putting them in the same component. And notice we're doing a cast. Because we're doing a cast, we have invited bugs to crawl right into this and, and it'd be a problem. And who would have known to suppress the assignment in the base class? So now we see why that, that happened. We're casting away const and bad things will now happen unless if we do what I said we weren't going to do. So here we have a function and it takes two things. It takes the address of a const lmref and it takes a const const lmref ref. Uh, okay. Now the idea for having this is to do slicing. We want to slice the object. That's our goal. When we slice the object, the, the outer one can no longer hide the, the, the inner, the, 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 the base class one, and so we'll get this. So that's why we wrote the function. And what we've done here is we've assumed that the base class assignment is implemented to demonstrate why it shouldn't be. That's the base class assignment. It says it's assigning to whatever came in the value of the other thing. And what that means, by the way, is just changing the pointer. It's just saying that this reference they can't modify anything. Now, now is going to get the, 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 the address from this reference that can't modify anything. That should be okay, right? Except it's not. So what happens is we start with our evil function, f, evil function, and we create a dummy type. A dummy type, of course, we can create a, a ref to that. So there's nothing wrong here. This is in our own business, right? Then we create a const lm ref. And, and, and we, we uh, take the address of the const alum that was coming in. And here's where the evil magic happens. We call the function slice off the, 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 um, the, the alum ref for the dummy to be the const alum ref, then do the assignment. And now the alum ref that went in, that be, turned into a const alum ref, is now capable of clobbering the element that came in. So we violated const correctness horribly. But if we just take out that assignment, we're good. Now in C++ references, we take out the assignment for both the const and the non-const reference. We're still good. Just throwing that in here. Inheritance is funny like this. But that notion of const will kill you if you don't really pay attention. Yes? Don't you think that uh, evil box here is not implementing uh, assignment operator? Is in Base class, but otherwise use a const cast. I don't understand. You said the base. I said the base class does not implement the assignment operator. Yes. The derived class does. You, you said uh, you should not implement uh, in assignment operator in base class because of this uh, evil can be yes. used. But in uh, my opinion, the problem here is using of const cast. Well, okay. So the. the, the what was said is, is it's not the assignment, it's the const cast. But in order to get the property we want, we have to take a pointer that doesn't give you access, writable access, and allow it to give you writable access with no other change. And as long as the assignment doesn't exist, as long as you can't rebind the reference, const correctness holds. So you may not like the design, but the purpose of this was allow, to allow me to substitute the derived class for the base class in all cases, and oh, please don't violate const correctness while you're doing it, and that's why I did it. Okay? Okay. okay. So, for structural inheritance, the reason we do structural inheritance is we won't want any overhead. These are all inline functions. There's no virtual functions or whatever. A, a, by the way, there are special cases 
very common ones, I'll bring up allocators again, where even though you don't uh, adulterate the, the type of the container with the type of the uh, allocator, um, and instead use the, the polymorphic approach where you have pass the, the, the base class of an allocator into the container, this is, this, is, this is a common idiom where the compiler has full knowledge of everything that's going on because the, the virtual functions in the derived allocator are inlined and the container is a template. And so all of the code is there visible to the, to the um, uh, uh, compiler of the client. And so you can have zero overhead due to runtime binding because there isn't any. It's all done at compile time. And this is a common idiom. It's certainly not true in all cases. But for this one specific case, we just I just want to make clear. But this is saying I don't even want to go there. This is all no virtual functions. It's all inline. And so if you have something like this, there's no, there's no runtime performance at all. This is a reason for doing structural inheritance. OK. Now finally, we get back to uh, implementation inheritance. And this is my absolutely least favorite of the three inheritances, but I can't say that it's useless. People do it all the time. So let's take a look at this. I have a, a widget client, operates on a widget. I have a composite widget, which is a kind of widget that does some changing around and manipulating whatever. Ideally, we'd like the composite widget to be everything a widget is and then some. That's probably not what happened here. So let's go muck with this. So we have a composite widget client that's operating off a composite widget. We have my widget that, that, that is a widget, but does something yet different. You know, who knows? And uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, you know, widget client, let's create an abstract interface where there's no implementation at all. And now the widget client is not, not coupled, not even at link time, not even at link time to the widget imp. The widget and the widget client can go off and party. That's a wonderful thing, right? No, no compile time coupling, no link time coupling. One of the glorious things about a, uh, abstract interfaces is that they really work well with large scale physical design. All right, so we have this. Now, you can create your widget and not pay any attention to widget imp. You've got your widget. I've got widget client and life is good. Uh, now, this, was, this seems like a good idea. So the next thing we might look at is, what if I have my composite widget, and I really like the idea of separating the implementation from the interface. So I try it again. So I do this. Does anybody see a problem? The colors make it look nice, but what's the problem? There's a real design problem here. This is an abstract interface. This is a bunch of code that implements it. This is an abstract interface that depends on a bunch of code. It's no longer a protocol because it doesn't, it's not, depends on something that isn't a protocol. Protocols don't have anything. So this is a problem. And even though it looks kind of pretty, what happens is when you implement your composite widget thinking you're not going to pick up anything else, you do pick up widget imp, and this is all bogus. So it looked like a good idea, but it's not a good idea. So we have to draw it a little differently. See, it's, it's, it's adulterated my, my, your composite widget. My, your, your composite widget. So now what we need to do is we need to get the implementation out of the way of the protocol hierarchy. And we do that by bending things around a little bit. Now a composite widget is a widget. And the composite widget can be used anywhere where a widget can be used. And it probably wasn't designed that way, which means you probably have to throw all of this out and start over. But at least now we have the, the trunk of the, the design is reasonable. Now, this can lead to a huge can of worms because you start out with like a composite pattern. And you say, I've got a widget. And then the composite widget is really, under the covers, it's a collection of, 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 of potentially a collection of widgets. And you say, you know, I could put, I could start to, to hack this a little bit. Like a widget is just a widget, but you could ask number of sub-objects. And it would say, oh, I can do that because if it's just a widget, it returns zero. And then if it's a composite widget, it'll return the number of, of subjects. You're starting to go down that road of a fat interface. It's so slow and subtle. It's very, very appealing. Then you say, well, maybe, maybe what I want to do is I want to add a widget to this collection. So you say, well, I don't know if it's a collection. It's just a widget. So maybe what I'll do is I'll put a status on it. And I'll say, try to add it if you can. And if you can't, I'll understand. Then you say, well, you know, <laughs> all right. 
So this brings up another one. There's dynamic cast. You can say, well, I've got a widget. I'll dynamic cast it to the composite widget. And if it doesn't work, I'll do something else. So this brings up another rule. Use dynamic cast only when you don't need it. <laughs> and I'm not joking. If you need the dynamic cast, you must not use it. If you don't need it, it's OK. And I say this kind of flippantly because as long as what you're doing is optional reporting or, or something that's along the lines of logging, like, well, I'd like to log the substructure of this, but if, if it's not there, I can't do it, then that's fine. Please, if you take a penguin and derive it from a bird, right? You know, the penguin can't fly. And then you throw the penguin off a cliff, right? And then say, fly. <laughs> Right? That is, not only is that a fat interface, that's a problem. What are you going to do? You're going to catch the penguin, right? Not catch an exception, you're going to catch the penguin. Otherwise, you'll, you'll lose important engineering resources, like penguins. <laughs> All right. So everything here now starts to look a little better. Widen the interface first, then implement it. That's the, the story here. The interface should be substitutable first, then implemented. Now it all works. The principal client of implementation inheritance is the derived class author. This is also known as selfish inheritance. If you're inheriting because you want to factor your code, not so good. If what you're doing is providing a factored implementation for a particular framework so that your clients, who are the derived class authors, can get their jo jobs done more quickly, it's tolerable. So here's an example. I have this, this nice, oh shoot. I have this nice example uh, where, oh, I'm just going to hopefully turn this off so it doesn't bother me again. Uh, um, I have this nice example where I have a widget and a composite widget and, and a bunch of, 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 of clients that want to play in my framework. And so here's my framework, but the framework operates on the widget and the composite widget. So that's all, that's all set. That's me. I'm the, I'm the library. I'm the, the, the core. And now I have this thing called a partial imp. And what it's like is I have to implement six things for a widget. This has three of them implemented for me. And I might have several different partial imps that are ready to go, so all you have to do is a little bit of work and you're good. It's not that you're overriding an existing implementation, it's that you're filling in what's missing. And so you can have many of them, and I can have a composite widget uh, partial imp over there, and I, as I said, I can have many of them that are set up, you know, A, B, C, D, E, and you just pick the one that's closest and fill in the rest. I'm not so happy about changing the implementation of one, in other words, overriding it further, but you know, that's, that's a little bit of an aesthetic. Then my widget can, can derive from this, and it's instantiable, whereas the widget partial imp is not instantiable. I have no problem with this. And you can do all kinds of good things like this, and uh, this is perfectly great. And then if I want to have a, their composite widget that does everything by, you know, just implements the widget protocol directly, or their widget implements it directly, I don't have to pay for anything I don't want. So I have full flexibility here, and I have some shortcuts. So. Combining kinds of inheritance, structural and interface. Um, sometimes we put a little syntactic sugar in a protocol just to make it a little bit more easy to use. And that's fine. Uh, sugar, it's efficiency. The next one is interface and implementation. Well, you can't really have implementation inheritance uh, without interface inheritance. It's sort of you, you, you're, you're trying to, to uh, first you want to widen the um, uh, uh, the interface, and then, only then, after, after that, you, uh, you implement it. The third one is implementation and structural. And this is a case where I feel uh, we've gone south. When you try to combine these two, you're trying to address the needs of both the client and the derived class author at the same time in the same physical unit, and that usually isn't a good idea. So, which I just said. So let's go to this. Here we have a reasonable thing. We have an, an abstract interface, uh, uh, but it also has an inline function. That's, that's, that's structural and interface inheritance in some sense in one place. Once I move this down, once I get rid of that, now the public client is bound to stuff that wasn't before that he wasn't before compile time coupled to, or it wasn't before compile time coupled to, which again adulterates the client with this unnecessary dependency. So rather than do that, 
we keep it the way it was. We don't do that. We keep them separate. I'm going to go back to this for one second. We want to keep it like this where we have our, our, our inline function and our pure virtual function and the client isn't bothered by that and then we move our, our implementation up here and we don't make the client depend on that at compile time. All right. So this graph has absolutely no validity whatsoever. It is my uh, you know, vision of what I think the world was like in 2009. Um, but it's how it feels to me. In common practice, there is a lot of implementation inheritance going on that shouldn't be. Absolutely should not be. And, and even when it is going on, it's going on in the wrong way. It doesn't follow what I suggested about breaking out the protocols or whatever. So that's unfortunate. Um, structural inheritance, I think people do it, but as we saw, there are very few cases where it makes sense because it isn't proper inheritance. And then finally, we have uh, the um, interface inheritance, which again, we don't use it that much. We use it in good places. We don't inject it everywhere we could just so we can create a mock or something like that. We use it where it makes sense in the architecture to decouple large pieces that don't have a, a high bandwidth issue. Right? If we're doing something that needs to be super fast, we probably don't want to be going through a, 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 a true broken virtual uh, function call. When I say broken, what I mean is separated into different translation units where, where you, there's no way for the compiler to optimize the, the runtime cost away. So we want to do that selectively. But there are also cases where it's perfectly fine. And a great example of this, if you're trying to uh, create an adapter for a database, uh, an abstract interface is absolutely the way to go. And the last thing you would want to do is have a, a, a um, implementation inheritance where part of the, the, uh, the base class knows about the database and you fill in the rest, where the client has to also know about the base class because then the, by transitivity you wind up making all the clients depend on the database all the time and that's just a bug, right? Okay. so. One last, one last try at this, which is um, substitutability. Um, we talked about Liskov. I think you might have gotten an inkling that there may be something there, and there is. Substitutability uh, in, in the sense of what she's talking about, where she says, uh, you know, the, the, we want this to be something, uh, everything that the, the other thing was, but something more, really does apply to physical design. And this is sort of my excuse for putting the, the first part of the talk in because here, if I take a version of a component, check it out, modify it, check it back in, what must be true? Every program written in terms of the old component should continue to work, right? That's what we mean by substitutability for components. It's really no different. It's just backward compatibility, oh, right? It's really cool. What must be satisfied? Well, logical behavior, all of the precondition stuff, all of, everything that was, we've talked about so far is true. Um, and then the essential behavior has to remain un, unchanged. That's another thing. You can't, you can't change something that is documented to be this and say, oh, I changed my mind. Now, the, 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 uh, the, the non-essential, non-undefined behavior is different. You can do that, but you have to be very careful. Um, New behaviors may be defined or extended, but you need to make sure that all existing programs remain OK. Now, their physical, the physical substitutability is real. Um, physical dependencies cannot increase much. It, if you have something and now you wind up depending on something adjacent to something else that's close by, it's not a big deal. But if you wind up depending on something that's humongous and far away, and all of a sudden you're dragging in you know, millions of lines that you weren't you know, of, of, of executable or, or object code that you weren't planning on, then, then that's a problem. Um, compile time. If I had something that would compile in a few minutes and now it's a few days, uh, no, that's not going to fly. The footprint can't increase much. Now, this is an interesting one. Nobody should be relying on the exact size of the footprint of something, but if you change your string implementation to the short string optimization, you're substantially increasing the size of a footprint. Things can overflow. It's not technically substitutable, but you do it because there are good reasons to do it, but you should be aware of it. So if you increase your footprint from uh, two words to a thousand words, expect trouble. Okay? Um, <coughs> 
Dynamic memory ca usage can't increase much. And what this means is if you have something that's working in production code, and then you do something that makes it phenomenally uh, 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 more uh, uh, memory hungry, it might not work on certain systems where it is today. So you could get pushback from that. You don't want to do that. Um, this is a critical one. If you don't allocate memory for your object today, forget about it. Because you may not be propagating your allocator down to the underlying parts. And so in particular, if, if I'm using a sub-object you've created that today does not take an allocator, and I implement my code properly, and you add an allocator pointer, I don't propagate to you. That is a bug, and half the object will wind up in some memory, and half the object will wind up somewhere else. And that's not good. So don't, don't think about this one. You've got to get right from the beginning. Um, and runtime. Um, you know, runtime is one of those things that can't change much. But I will point out, if you have something that on average will run 10 times faster, and in one case it'll run 10 times slower, it's not substitutable. So you have to, you know, pe people love to do this stuff. Oh, I've got this thing. It's really faster in almost all operations. But anyway, we've had that come up. So we had to choose. We had to choose something that didn't get worse much, even though we could have made something much, much better because of that last rule. And it so happens that it's the uh, daytime class. So we care. Uh, all right. So questions. Any questions on this? Does everybody know what Liskov substitution is now so well they could explain it to their mom? Yes. Um, so in the, the first part of the talk, you talked about how a function provides like, the guaranteed behavior and then certain things that are undefined behavior. And then you have this other category. I don't remember exactly what you call it, like incidental behavior. It's not, no, it's, it's, it's not undefined. It's not essential. So, so what that means is it's not part of the contract exactly what happens, but implicitly it doesn't blow up. It's not undefined. So it does something reasonable. As in, it doesn't record up, it doesn't end, doesn't set fire to your machine. Uh, but you don't know exactly what it does. Do derived classes have to match that behavior? That's an interesting question. Um, that's a very interesting question. Do derived classes have to match that behavior? Um, do derived class. Um, all right, well, so let's start with this. If we're talking about interface inheritance, no. Uh, if we're talking about structural inheritance, yes. And if we're talking, because with interface inheritance, there is no behavior to match. Yeah. Right. With structural inheritance, there's behavior to match. OK. And with implementation inheritance, it's, it's closer to interface inheritance if done properly than not. So I'll, I'll say literally yes and no, depending on the inheritance. That's, that's my off the, it's a fine question. But, but clearly, since the essential behavior doesn't have to match, the non-essential behavior doesn't have to match either. Whereas with the structural inheritance, the behavior has to match exactly. Because it's, 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 it shouldn't matter which pointer you're calling from. Whereas with, with uh, virtual functions, there's no hope of doing it differently. right? Well, if you're, whether you go through the base class or derived class, it doesn't matter. It's going to be the same virtual function that's called for a, for a given object. So for structural inheritance, since there are no virtual functions, you have to simulate uh, the functionality. I guess what I meant to say is this. Um, you'll get it for free with the other two, and you have to work on it with structural inheritance. You can't just do whatever you want. It'll happen for free with the other two. So does that mean that if you're using structural inheritance, you have to stay up to date with implementation details of the base class to make sure that you match the Absol behavior? Absolutely. But you'll see you don't do it much. Right. If you're hiding, well, Scott Myers says don't hide um, 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 uh, functions in derived classes. Don't hide non-virtual functions. So that's good advice. Then you don't have this problem. But if you do decide to do it for good reason, then yes, you do. And notice they're in the same component in the example that I gave. So it's not that hard. But very painful question to ask so late in the talk. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, any of these? Last one. How are structural inheritance, logical substitutability, and backward compatibility of physical components related? The whole idea here, I think, is one word, substitutability. If the newer version 
which is the super type, does everything the older version did in terms of all programs written in terms of it, you're good. If not, you're not good, in a nutshell. Okay, so we'd be almost done. Uh, this was the outline. I want to briefly summarize what we talked about, because it's been nearly three hours. Uh, components review, right? Um, a component, a .h.cpp pair, satisfying four essential properties, not all of which we talked about in detail, is our fundamental unit of both logical and physical software design. And everything that we write, except the main program, we uh, say it in terms of components. <sighs> logical relationships such as is and uses between classes imply physical dependencies among the components that define them. That is pretty much what physical design is about. Please, no cyclic dependencies, no long distance friendships, those are the two most important design rules by far that we have. There are a lot of others, but they pale in comparison to this one. These two. Sorry. All right. Interfaces and contracts. Uh, an interface is syntactic. A contract is semantic. We write contracts for human beings. The contracts we write for human beings are the most complete, and then we will be able to introduce um, some checking and then uh, from what we are able to do, we will choose to implement some subset of that and actually check it. Okay. A contract defines both pre and post conditions and essential behavior, which is a superset of post conditions. Undefined behavior is, uh, occurs if a precondition isn't met. So, well, remember, it's library undefined behavior, and you can still recover from it in the right build mode. So remember, library versus language. Language is really, all bets are off, really, really, even for you. What undefined behavior does is undefined, especially at the interface for the function being called. So when you have a precondition and you don't meet it, there should be no way for the caller to figure out what's going to happen. Only the person who owns main and the build system should be able to make a blanket statement that says, I want to expend this much CPU, broad strokes, and if I catch something, I want this to happen. No one else has a say. There's only one, the owner of main. But fortunately, every owner of every main in the universe can put their own handler in to do what they want to do. So it's a wonderful solution. All right. It also gives us a common vocabulary of what we mean by a build mode. It either is not checking, it's checking for things in contract, and it's checking as an audit mode for things that aren't quite in contract, but we have a problem. So we really want to catch it. OK, documented essential behavior must not change. Test drivers must vary all essential behavior. So if you have essential behavior, you should be testing that that is, in fact, happening thoroughly. And finally, assertions and destructors help verify invariance, because that's the only thing we need to know, uh, know how to do. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> narrow versus wide contracts. The significance of undefined behavior, well, narrow contracts admit undefined behavior. Appropriately narrow contracts are good. So if somebody says, no, I need to have everything defined, there should be nothing I can put in that could ever cause a problem, I strongly disagree. Uh, it reduces the costs associated with development and testing. It improves performance and reduces object code size. It allows useful behavior to be added as needed. It enables practical, effective, defensive programming. And here's the really important one. Defensive programming means fault intolerance, not fault tolerance. It's really important. If this all gets confused with fault tolerance, I've failed. OK. And finally, proper inheritance. We just went through. Um, the derived class must adhere to both contracts, except for that thing I'm not going to mention again, which is there's two adults talking in the room. And they say, OK, that we agree. And then the judge says, do it. Okay, The static type of a pointer reference should make no difference in programmatic behavior. And that's what your question was. It should make no difference. So for two of the three cases, it won't because it's virtual functions. For the third one, it shouldn't. So that's, that's the answer I meant to give you when I started thinking on it. Um, interface inheritance is virtually all we need. That's supposed to be a joke. Um, so this is the big one. The other stuff is, is edge cases. And backward compatibility for components is a whole lot like proper structural inheritance. And with that, I am done. Okay.
And uh, we have a couple of minutes. If anybody has questions, that, uh, feel free. Yes, sir. Um, so you said before that the proper way to implement an iterator is using inheritance from the constant iterator. That, that would be for the reason, yes. Yeah, so I had said that the, that the, the, the ideal way, the, 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 the way that doesn't um, cause some difference between the two to occur uh, via user-defined conversions is, is to do that. That, was, that is what I said. Yes. Um, and so then at the same time, though, you talked about not implementing the assignment operator for the const version of the, the reference case. But const iterators need assignment. Right, that is the next book. So what was said was uh, we didn't implement the, uh, the assignment because of a problem that can occur when you cast away const. So that is, an, that is an interesting point. So I will have to go and investigate how it's done because it is done that way. So I wonder if there's another issue. We may be trading one thing for another. Okay, but, but we all understand it's the, re, the rebinding is the one. Yes, and of course, of course iterators need to be copied. Yes? Um, do you have an opinion on um, uh, uh, dy dynamically dispatched um, type erased interfaces as opposed to um, uh, in inheritance based interfaces? Okay, so the question was do I have an opinion on type erased interfaces versus uh, interface based interface? Inter <laughs> Interface-based interfaces, I hope I said that right. So there are three things. There's, there's invading the type of the container with a, a parameter. There is type erasure, which is a hybrid of the two. And then there is one that I like, which is passing in an abstract base class, which is the one that's being adopted in the 17. The example of the type erasure uh, that came about was shared pointer. When people realized that if you put an allocator into a type, it became a new type, I mean in, into a template, it became a new type, not compatible with other types. The only place it worked uh, would be in generic programming or using iterators to access it. Then shared pointer, which is a prime example of a vocabulary type, came along and they did not want to have the allocator by the type of the shared pointer. It was just a shared pointer of something, right? So we wanted all the shared pointers, regardless of how they were deleted, to, 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 to be accepted the same way. So what happens is you create, you have a, a constructor that in effect is, is object-oriented programming inside the class. The, the templated constructor builds whatever it's going to do. I'm just explaining for the, for the rest of the folks. And then, and, then, and then it derives from some internal base class. It's internal. And then the only thing the internal base class needs is, is the ability to make it make the, make the internal structure go away when, when all the shared pointers go away. And that works only because you don't need to get at the allocator ever again or the deleter until the object goes out of scope. This is not the case with other things like function uh, and there are some other examples. And so there are some real problems with, 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 uh, with the type erased approach. They work in special cases but they don't work in all cases, and we need something that works in all cases. And finally, I really like the idea of not having an inheritance hierarchy inside a closed system. Once you have an inheritance hierarchy, or you have, you have a base class and you have things, it's an open system. Anybody can come along and write a derived class, and, and it's, not, it's not like I have a switch that says, if it's this, call this, if it's this, call this, because that's, that's not you know, it's not object-oriented programming in, in, in this glorious, extensible way. It's just a big switch statement. So the, the type erasure is a, is a hybrid, as I said. It's using templates, but it's also using object-oriented programming, and it doesn't work in cases where you need the allocator throughout the life of the object. Does that sound like a plausible answer? Yes. Okay, good. All right, how are you guys doing? It's now, we're out of time, I think, so I want to thank you for coming. I almost survived, but I owe you an answer to something. <laughs>